Kayaks were made from river fishing. They carry anglers to productive waters efficiently and quietly. I'm always amazed at what happens around me when I'm in a kayak. All of nature seems to accept my presence and I get a front row seat to business as usual. But there can be some problems with this approach. I'm Jeff Little, owner of Blue Ridge Kayak Fishing LLC and author of My Life in a Kayak in Pursuit of Trophy Smallmouth Bass. I've been teaching river kayak fishing since 2001, earning instructor certification through the American Canoe Association I used their lesson plan as a framework for my classes. Built upon a solid river safety, paddling technique, and efficient maneuvering curriculum, I've added many angling specific skill sets to the class, including stealth approaches, pattern development, trip planning, and maintaining boat position. This DVD covers the same river kayak fishing skill set I've taught to hundreds of anglers over the last decade. I hope you enjoy it. Choosing the right boat for river fishing starts with asking oneself a series of questions. How much white water will I encounter? In other words, how maneuverable of a kayak will I need? Will I use it in waters other than rivers? How much weight capacity do I need considering my own weight plus the weight of my gear? Generally, the longer the kayak, the less maneuverable it is, but the faster it is. The shorter the kayak, the more maneuverable it is, but you trade in some speed. Wider kayaks are more stable, and there again, you trade in some speed. The best place to find help answering these questions is at a demo day. Basically, the boats start in increments of about 10, 12, 14, 16 feet. And uh, so, you know, the bigger the person, you know, the, actually the bigger the boat works a lot better. So you don't want to put like a 200 and some pound guy on a 10 foot boat. You want to kind of size the boat. And that's one thing that a demo day will do is allow you to get in that boat. Say, and a lot of people will just go, well, I just want a little short boat. Right. So they'll, they'll go and try to buy a 10 foot boat from some place and then they get it and they realize it's not an appropriate boat. My personal favorite for river fishing is the Tarpon 120 Ultralight. Its agility in white water is unmatched among sit-on-tops. Using it in creative access points requires very little effort. Maintaining boat position comes easily, whether you drag it up onto a rock with you or just one-hand paddle in current. I feel so strongly about this boat that I've converted my entire fleet of class kayaks over to this 42-pound boat. Paul and Roy are in the Tarpon 120 Ultralight for the first time today. Paul, why don't you tell me a little bit about the boats that you already own? I currently own a, um, a regular Tarpon 120 and a Ride 135. And without a doubt, this, this light 120 positions and holds much better than the regular 120. What's your take on it, Roy? I've got the regular 120 and sitting in this thing, it's incredible. With a light paddle like the fish sticks, you can sit there and maintain against current. Uh, if you're trying to make speed and make uh, a lot of distance with hardly any effort at all, you're just gliding through the water. I mean, this is definitely the Cadillac of kayaks for stream fishing or river fishing. How wide a kayak is affects how stable it is. This is a wilderness systems ride. And it's one of the most stable boats on the market. You can stand up in it 
caught fish this way. I've actually had a big muskie about that big tow me with it while I was standing and then break off and I was able to maintain my stability. The ability to stand up and sight fish when you have clear water is a huge asset. Both the ride in this boat, the Commander 140, afford you higher vantage points. I'm in a Wilderness Systems Commander 140 today, mostly because I was out here four or five days ago in a Tarpon 120 Ultralight, uh, which, is, which is my favorite boat, but I've decided to bring this boat, uh, the Commander 140, because it's, it's one I can stand up in. Uh, it is Wilderness System's most stable boat, and it allows me to, to stand up. I actually, I could sit down in the, the regular seat, which I actually didn't even bring today, because I knew I'd be doing a lot of standing and sight fishing. You can sit in the, the captain's perch here. Um, you can kneel in it. A lot of different high angle um, perspectives, which is great for the sight fishing that I'm doing today. Mostly, most of the fish that I've caught um, a couple days ago and today were from spots where you'd have a big boulder and you'd have shade along one side of the big boulder as it dropped off. They tucked down in there, um, and it, especially at the ends of the the, the tail outs of these these poles. Um, but to be able to stand up and sight fish, not necessarily for the fish themselves, but for the um, the kind of structure that they're going to be on, which are pretty much the you know the boulder and chunk rock shade. Uh, a lot of these ledge rocks make make real nice. You know they come up and then they cut back in and the fish tuck up underneath there. And uh, if you're sitting down, you're not gonna see that until you're right on top of it. If you're standing up, you can make a nice long cast without sitting right, you know, coming right up onto them and spooking them, so. There's one to jump. When I first saw someone standing in a kayak, I honestly thought to myself, wow, what a great gimmick to sell kayaks, but I'll never actually do it while I'm fishing. Well, I don't do it when it's windy or when the river is high, but in low, clear conditions, the more I'm upright and looking around, the quicker I understand what's going on and the more fish I catch. The next consideration is finding a life vest comfortable enough to leave it on all day. The life vest is something that's, it's just an automatic, it's like getting in your car and putting your seatbelt on. It doesn't come off. I uh, actually lost a buddy up on the Susquehanna who took his off. He was a jet boater and he, he took it off. I'm not sure why, but he took it off and he, what he did is he slid it on the, the backrest of his, you know, of his, his jet boat seat. And, uh, you know, they, they eventually found him, they found his boat empty. The boat had the, the motor pulled apart, you know, parts and tools all over the bottom. Um, and he was anchored up, obviously had some some engine problems and they found his corpse unfortunately in a jumble of logs um, you know at one of the dams one of the big dams on the Susquehanna uh, but you know it, it, it you know really from that moment forward I always kept it on I have some old pictures that I'd love to use you know nice big smallmouth you know uh, great scenery in the background but I won't use them because um, I like many kayak fishermen you know took it off and it was, you know, on many of those shots, it was strapped to the back deck of um, the old perception access that I had.
but yeah, I won't, won't use those shots anymore, which is kind of a bummer. But it's really just a statement to say, this is automatic. It's, it's just like your seatbelt in your car. You, you just wear it and you just leave it on. first thing most river kayak anglers want to put on their boat is an anchor. Although I used to use one, I'm not a big fan. When you lower the anchor, it clangs on the bottom, spooking fish. I've heard countless stories of guys dropping their anchor in current that they misjudged, leading to a capsizing. But it was a traumatic personal experience that brought me to look for other methods to maintain boat position. Here are a few options. The first one is one hand paddling. It requires pointing the nose of the kayak upstream and keeping it there with short strokes. Just as with ferrying, a maneuver we will learn later, the phrase, a stitch in time saves nine, applies with great significance. Make use of your elbows on the paddle shaft when you need extra power. A lightweight paddle like the Adventure Technology Fish Sticks helps too. If one-hand paddling is the most difficult way to maintain boat position, then wedging is the easiest. Once you are wedged securely, you can fully concentrate on your presentation. Bill here is going to wedge on that rock, that real shallow rock, just to the right of him. He's going to use that spot to get himself stationary in order to fish this large eddy right up here. Got a lot of nice water right behind the rock that I'm standing on, and he's in a stationary position, which is real important to feel that very subtle bite. Current isn't the only reason we need to maintain boat position. Windy days can be super frustrating. Here I used the wind to my advantage. It held me against this ledge rock, allowing me to catch fish from the eddies above and below. Rocks aren't the only things you can wedge on. Here, Roy wedges in a grass bed to fish the eddy it creates. Meanwhile, I'm being swept downriver from a spot where I might have tried the one-hand paddling technique. When fishing places with a gravel, sand, or soft bottom, a stakeout stick holds you in place nicely. Run it through the scupper hole of your sit-on-top kayak and you're ready to fish. I made mine from the handle of an old broken rake. Sure beats raking leaves. Use your feet to maintain boat position wherever possible. When this happens to you, don't get mad. Look around for somewhere to cast. Here, there was nothing obvious to wedge on. So I hopped up onto a submerged rock and allowed the current to hold the kayak against my legs. For those of us inclined to wade, a leash attached to the belt turns your kayak into a floating work deck. Just don't be surprised when they try and hog tie you with your own line.
when I started kayak fishing, I just bought the boat, the paddle, the life vest, and went out and did it. For two years, I practiced an ingrained poor paddling technique. Years later, in a paddling course, the instructor commented that I was the strongest paddler enrolled in the class. Sounds like a compliment, right? Well, his tone of voice was anything but complimentary. What he meant was that I was paddling hard, not smart. Unlearning poor paddling technique proved to be a challenge, but it has made me a better angler. My stealth improved, my paddling-related soreness and injuries disappeared, and I became very adept at moving from spot to spot. In short, I started catching bigger smallmouth. With any paddle stroke, there are three distinct parts. The catch, the power, and the recovery. The catch, in particular, you want to pay attention to. You insert the blade into the water, and you pause, and then you go with the power phase. If you don't do this, and you go straight into the power phase, you make a lot of noise, which is not good as a kayak fisherman, you're going to be spooking a lot of fish. It's a bad habit. What it also does is it saps most of your energy during the paddle stroke. This is like a sports car. If you were to hook up a trailer to a sports car, it wouldn't perform the way it should. The paddle is the same way. By failing to pause when you do your catch, it's like you're hooking up a trailer. You're dragging something behind it. That dragging, that mixture of air and water, requires energy. Whereas if you get a nice, clean seal first, you transfer more of your power to propelling you forward. The path that the shaft takes during the stroke determines what kind of stroke you're doing. If you go from front to back along the side, that's a forward stroke. If you go from back to front along the side, it's a reverse stroke. If you start close, but at your midpoint, you're out away from the kayak, and your ending point, you come back. In other words, a C, that's a sweep stroke. That's meant to turn the kayak. Now I'm gonna do a reverse sweep. Another stroke that can be useful is the draw stroke. You start out away and bring it into your head. Good self-assessment tool for having a good catch is listening. Your ears will tell you if you've had a good catch or not. Go ahead and close your eyes right now. And let me know, is this a good catch right here? That was pretty noisy, wasn't it? Now I'm going to try and do a better job. I'm going to insert the blade, pause, and then bring it back. Much quieter. Okay, you can open your eyes now, and you can see a good catch. Insert the blade all the way, and you get more power from it. Torso rotation is something that I personally struggled a lot with when I started paddling. I didn't take a class, I just started doing it. And because of that, I developed bad habits. Namely, I paddled with my arms. I had good strong arms, but I didn't have even a quarter of the power that I could have if I'd have learned from the beginning to incorporate all muscle groups, especially upper legs, stomach, lower back, chest, in addition to the arms. So one good way to, one way that I learned how to break my bad habit paddling with my arms as opposed to torso rotation, you put the paddle on your head like this. Bring it down in front of you. You see how that makes a box? My elbows are roughly at 90 degree angles. If that box becomes a triangle, I know that I'm paddling with my arms as opposed to if it maintains the box, I'm doing torso rotation. That helps a lot with the sweep. Rapids can throw you for a curve sometimes. If your sweep stroke isn't solid and you need to turn the kayak right there, right now, you may be in trouble. With the sweep stroke, 
At the end of it, there's another self-assessment tool. If your paddle is along the length of the kayak, you've done a good sweep. You've also done a good torso rotation, evidenced by the elbows still being at roughly 90 degree angles. During the forward stroke, a good self-assessment tool of, of torso rotation is, are you looking at the back of the boat on every forward stroke? If you look at the back of the boat, wherever the head goes, the body follows. Same thing on a reverse stroke. You start by looking at the back of the boat. You're going to get more power. So look at which way you're, you're rotating your torso. If you continue to look forward, you will paddle with your arms. Why it's important? Power, you get more power if you torso rotate. You also save yourself the, uh, the trouble of having repetitive motion injuries, like rotator cuff or te tennis elbow. So get good torso rotation from the beginning. One of the often touted advantages of, of being in a kayak as a fishing platform is its stealth. Now, the stealth isn't automatic though, and what I think a lot of anglers need to realize is um, their role in stealth. Um, it certainly gives you an advantage, but fishermen, just like hunters, need to constantly analyze the signals they send out into their environment, really into the fish's environment in terms of uh, the fish's sensory organs. Uh, obviously they can see you coming if you're, you're moving a lot, if you're waving your arms and they, you know, especially if you're in a nice clear pool like this, you want to move in on it nice and slow. I will routinely drift like this with one leg in the water just to keep myself, if, I, if there's a rock coming up, rather than letting my boat bang into it, which would spook the pool, having my foot hit it first and slowly coming to rest on it is much better than banging into it with the boat. So make use of your feet. Here's a rock I can stop on right here. Also their lateral line can detect large movements from a great distance away. Another sensory organ is their, um, their inner ear and swim bladder. They kind of work in conjunction and they can pick up sounds. So you want to make sure that you don't, you don't send uh, unnatural sounds out into their environment. Something I started using to minimize the sound I send out into the, the fish's environment is the silent traction system. Uh, it's, it's something similar to what we what I used to do when I was using sit-in kayaks. Uh, we would take mouse pads, cut them up, and glue them on the rim. Just crazy glue them right on the rim. So when you laid your paddle down, it didn't send a big booming, you know, banging of the, the paddle shaft against your your kayak hull that spread out into the pool and spooked all the fish. Uh, now I'm using the the different sizes of pads. The the silent traction system in places like where I would lay my pliers down in the bottom of the kayak. Places where the paddle routinely hits the hull of the kayak. Anywhere that there's uh, likely to have a banging of the kayak, I'm going to put some of this um, self-adhesive, these pads. I'm not sure if it's the fish's lateral line, their swim bladder, their inner ear, but there's 
there's some way that fish can really feel you coming, much in the same way that, you know, when, you know, people who have bad joints, they know when it's going to rain, that low pressure moves into the area, and they just know it's going to rain. I think it's water pressure in the pool. When a large vessel moves into the pool, it changes way before the wake even reaches the fish. way that I realize that they can they can sense you coming before they even feel the wake or, or hear you coming or see you coming um, is catfishing with my brother on the upper Potomac River. We'd go at night, um, full moon out, the, the pool above Seneca Breaks would be smooth as glass and we'd move our 17 foot aluminum Grumman canoe upstream pretty quickly. We'd send a nice wake out over it, over that pool, but we would see uh, way out, I mean 20 feet out beyond the where the wake was, we'd see carp spooky. And I always wondered, what, how can they tell that we're coming? I didn't question it beyond that, I just accepted that they could. And the only way to minimize that is just to move slower. So, to really be stealthy, as you move up on a target area, you want to go nice and slow. It also doesn't hurt to make a very long cast. Braided lines with the fluorocarbon leader and rods seven feet or longer put more distance between you and your target. You're no longer paddling with good torso rotation. You don't want to go really fast. You just start tiptoeing along. When fishing eddies like this one, I'll drift past it, then quietly pick it apart, moving incrementally upstream. That way you sneak up on them, deliver a nice accurate cast, and they don't know you're there. Another way that they can tell, uh, they can detect something unnatural is through their, their sense of taste and smell. Catfish in particular have, have you know, taste and smell receptors all over their body, in their mouth. That's what their specialty is, is smell and taste. Bass have it to a limited degree on the front of their face and certainly in their mouth and on their tongue. They can smell and taste things. They have nasal cavities that, that flow water in. They have two holes on either side, flows water in and then out through the same side. And where anglers can go wrong is they can transfer smells and tastes to their bait. Things like nicotine, sunscreen, um, all sorts of unnatural smells that, that we as anglers inadvertently transfer to our bait. Um, one thing that I'll always do after I apply more sunscreen is I'll reach down into the river, get a handful of gravel or silt, maybe even rub up on some just some natural stuff. I'll get that, I'll get that smell off of my hands. That way I'm not transferring that sunscreen uh, smell right onto the bait. Another really bad one is DEET, the, the active chemical in an insect repellent. I just deal with it. I don't carry the stuff. It's just, it's just poison to your lures. It makes it so they'll pick it up and as soon as they pick it up, they'll drop it. Just like the insects don't like how it smells and tastes, fish don't like it either. So, overall, you just want to constantly analyze the, the signals you're sending out into the fish's environment. The first step to that is becoming knowledgeable about uh, their, their sensory organs and how they sense things. One way that I became knowledgeable about that was reading Keith A. Jones' book called Knowing Bass great book that talks about the biology and physiology and behavior of, of bass in particular. If you want to learn more about stealth approaches, read Knowing Bass by Keith A. Jones.
most important thing you can do when you get a new kayak is to learn the point of no return. Gradually lean in either direction until you find the tipping point. This exercise is also a good way to practice bracing or slapping the paddle on the water to bring the kayak back under your center of gravity. If I have a student who is paddling too conservatively while learning the maneuvers, this drill gives an immediate boost of confidence. After you learn the tipping point of your kayak, it's time to develop some maneuvering skills. Although I learned these from the kind of whitewater nut who likes to cram himself into a shoebox sized kayak so that he may fling himself off a cliff, these skills still have tremendous application to fishing. If you can't perform a crisp eddy turn, you will miss out on skipping a tube into a big fish holding foam pocket. If you are so fearful of the upcoming rapid that you can't effectively fish the push water above it, again, you're missing out. Learn how to attain, eddy turn, ferry, and peel out, and you'll be able to drop the right presentation onto big fish wherever they are. The peel out is a maneuver that I honestly don't use that much in kayak fishing, but it's an essential one to learn just for your own safety. What it teaches you is to always lean down current. In whitewater paddling, you'd peel out because you, you know, you'd be in an eddy and you're going to head back downstream. All you're doing is you're crossing from slack water in the eddy out into fast moving current. And you want to lead into the turn. Just like in NASCAR. Uh, if you've ever walked on a NASCAR track, the turns are embanked. That's to keep the, the, the cars on the track. Without those, they'd go flying off. The same concept applies here. If you don't lean into the turn, you're gonna go flying off. So let me do it here the correct way, and then I'll show you what happens sometimes. It's good to have a good head of steam as you as you cross. You're nice and fast, and as soon as you cross, lean down current. Lean. Just like leaning downstream when you do the rock brooch. When you bump into a rock, you lean into the rock. You lean downstream on a peel out. Because what it'll do, the current will hit the bottom of the boat and deflect under. If you drop your hip, that current will stack up on the, the upstream side and flip you going that way. So be prepared. As soon as you cross, lean downstream. Or else this right here happens. Ferrying is a whitewater maneuver which is also very useful for kayak fishermen. There's a lot of uh, ledges in the rivers that we fish and we can go back and forth along those ledges, popping lures in, in eddies as we go. In order to do it without working too hard though, uh, it's, it's important to get good at, at fairing and have proper technique. Uh, for this maneuver, what you're controlling is the angle of your kayak in relation to the angle of the current that's hitting it as you go across these chutes. The stronger the current you encounter, the more you want to point your bow, the front of the kayak, into that current. The slacker water you get into, the more you can point across. Right here, my goal, my target is to get into the eddy right down there behind that rock. My goal is to go the shortest distance, a straight line, across. The first time, I'm going to do it the wrong way. I'm going to point directly at it, not control the angle of my kayak in relation to the angle of the current. And we'll see how many strokes it takes for me to get over there. Count them. When I come back, I will control the angle of my kayak in relation to the current. Count how many strokes it takes me to get back.
took me 24 paddle strokes to get across and only six to get back. Also on the return trip, I made a straight line, which was my initial goal. I came directly across, whereas going over, I pointed the kayak straight across and I got way downstream and had to paddle hard back up to the, the target. If you do find that you need to attain upstream through a chute, you'll really learn to appreciate torso rotation. Advance in the slack water of the eddies as far as you can. Then as you cross into the strongest current, deliver several powerful sweep strokes on the downstream side. Don't forget to have a clean catch when inserting your paddle blade into the water. Listen for the cavitation noise and eliminate it. Efficiency always trumps an exhaustive effort. Although not technically a maneuver, running a rapid is the most basic skill a river angler needs to master. Every seasoned river kayak angler has a story about their first flip. Take the time to learn a few self-preservation skills so your story only ends with the loss of some gear. Scouting a rapid is always the first step. Take your time choosing the best chute to run. If you just don't feel comfortable running it, please portage. Portage is just paddler speak for getting out and dragging your kayak around the dangerous rapid. If you feel any peer pressure to run a rapid beyond your comfort level, a quick tally of the dollar value of fishing gear in your kayak should serve to defend your pride. $500 in rods, another $400 in tackle, and all of a sudden portaging isn't considered wimpy. It's just good common sense. I routinely portage rapids that are well within my skill level, just to prove the point. Guys, when we run rapids like this, this is probably not even a class one, but it's still, there is still some danger to it. The important thing when running any rapid is that you maintain speed running through it. We're going to encounter some bigger ones further downstream. With any drop, you want to run it perpendicular to the drop. Uh, that's just the safest way to, to run through there. You're going to point the kayak in the downstream Vs. Oftentimes, that's where most of the white water is. This beginner paddler starts out well with speed approaching the drop, but soon commits a very common beginner mistake. He stops paddling once he's in the rapid. Fortunately, this rapid was a straight shot all the way through. Notice here how I continue to paddle hard all the way through the drop. Speed is stability. That's worth repeating. Speed is stability. Now notice here how a lack of speed leaves you vulnerable to tipping. One thing I did do right here was to assume the safe swimmer position once I dumped. Safe swimmer position, feet up off the bottom pointed downstream, prevents foot entrapments, a potentially lethal situation. When a foot entrapment occurs, the ankle gets wedged between two rocks. The only way it's coming back out is in the direction it entered from the upstream direction. With the full force of the river preventing that, 
you may find yourself in serious trouble, so please keep your feet up. Reading the rapid correctly to find the downstream pointing V's, or tongues, takes practice. Follow an experienced paddler through rapids to speed up your learning curve. The safest routes often look the scariest, lots of white water. The most dangerous places to run a rapid look like a flat horizon on the water without any white water visible. Go where most of the water is funneling and go hard. Expect to crash into rocks when running rapids. The reaction you have when hitting a rock determines whether you dump or not. It is human nature to lean away from the rock that startled you. Doing so allows the water piling up on the upstream side to flip the kayak in that direction. I teach my students to lean into the rock with the following drill. Notice how I have my student looking away from the rock. Not seeing it coming quickly teaches the muscle memory reaction of leaning into the rock. Oh, lean into it. Nicely. Now, do a sweep stroke on the upstream side and lean into it and keep going. Nice. Here's the same rock I flipped on in the last segment. This time, the current deflects under the kayak as I quickly find my way to the next spot to cast to. When I was new to kayak fishing whitewater, the rapid running terrified me. It's also one of the biggest reasons I kept coming back for more. I see that same fear in the eyes of my students. Telling them what to do with all that nervous energy, paddle harder, is the most surefire way to make sure that they come through it upright. The biggest beginner mistake is to stop paddling mid-rapid because you have to mentally process the difference between how you thought the rapid was laid out and what you found when you got there. I'll say it one last time. Speed is stability. Exploration and kayak fishing are synonymous as far as I'm concerned. I do have favorite waters that I consistently catch big fish from each season, but somehow catching them from waters I've never seen before satisfies more. Here's a segment that chronicles the research, trip planning, and execution of a float trip on a smallmouth stream. Yo! Hey man, have you ever fished Patunka Creek? Where's that? I was up at a conference near Smithsburg and I was driving over on the way home. I was really upset that I didn't have a rod in the car at the time. I've never heard of it. Let me look it up on Flash Earth. What town did you say it was near? I think I just passed Lewistown and the creek joined the river about 10 miles up from there. Yep, Lewistown. Here it is. Yeah, the, the topo around it looks good. Lots of ridge lines crossing it. Uh, man, you know there's ledge trenches all around this. How wide did you say it was where you crossed it? From what I could tell, it was about, it was bigger than the Monocacy, but not as uh, wide as the Juniata. Let me check out the average stream flow on the USGS. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's a nice sized creek. Average CFS is about 200, 230. Let me see what Gertler says about it. Yep, here it is. Gradient's about 5. Uh, difficulty, he says, is 1. He covers about 25 and a half miles of it. Here's the trip description. The creek now meanders through a changing landscape, evolving from open, tidy farmlands at first. The creek works down into a shallow, 
wooded gorge, you must carry a three foot dam above PA Route 789, a five foot dam below State Road 2034 has largely crumbled, but the debris and rebar that clogged the chute will justify a carry, at least at lower levels. Canoeable winter and spring within four days of hard rain. Um, if it rains, if it rains Thursday like it's supposed to, we should be able to run this. Maybe we'll do one of the, the uh, further downstream runs where it's bigger. Okay, Saturday, 6.30. Sounds good. We'll see you then. Bye. I think this is it. Where do you think we... Where do you think we park? Look at that. All right, we're here at the, the put-in with Paul and Roy, and uh, <clears throat> we have some of our real basic tools of exploration. The first one is a Pennsylvania Atlas and Gazetteer. They make these for all the states, and uh, this will show you some of the primary and secondary roads used to, to run the shuttle. Uh, a second <clears throat> very useful tool is the paddling guide for the state that you're you're exploring. Um, here we're using Edward Gertler's Keystone Canoeing uh, and it shows it, it basically simplifies your your shuttle routes so that uh, you know you don't you don't have to look at all of the roads in the area you can just look at the ones that connect to um, you know the, the float that you want to do. It also shows um, your access points, put-ins, take-outs, uh, the distances between bridges and access points. What else were you guys able to find just to, in your, your research in this piece of water? I went on Google uh, and punched up the name of the creek we're fishing, and, or wanted to explore, and got some information from the Pennsylvania water trail map that you can see here, and it shows pieces of the creek and it also has a listing of various put in and take out points which was good and then from that I can go on any given map and look up the information. Paul you found that too. Show us what you did with with that. I also got the water trail map and I was able to, fortunate enough to be able to laminate it to so take it with me on the trip so there's no fear of it getting wet. And I was also able to get the Google map uh, of the creek as well with uh, the terrain elevation so you can also see that and as well as cross streets to for easy put in and take out. That's a topo map. Yes. What? It, how do you use that? I mean how is that that better than just the regular water trail map? Well you can sort of see elevations up and down throughout the trail and make sure you're going in the correct direction which is always important. Yeah. And as well you can just sort of get an idea of deeper pulls for this as well. Nice. Something else that I um, <clears throat> That I had done is I ordered a, a map of the region from mytopo.com. Where's our put in here? The put in is right down in the bottom left corner. Okay. And you just go all the way down. You're going to cross two different bridges. And we were going to be taken out at the second bridge. Okay. Right there. So what's our what's our plan of attack? We got both vehicles here. The what plan of attack at this point is to drop the boats here, have one person wait here, and move the the largest vehicle. To the end of the shuttle so okay. that we can then load load the equipment and the boats back up and then come back to the start and pick up the first guards. Alright, I'll be back in like 20 minutes. Whenever I get to the takeout point, I like to get my handheld GPS out and mark a waypoint. That way, as we progress through the trip, I have an idea. I can check and see how much progress we've made and if we need to speed up or if we need to slow down. A really good rule of thumb for floating you know, smaller creeks like this, or even big rivers, uh, is a, you should plan on fishing at about a mile an hour. You ready? Yep. Dude, are you sure you have the keys to the takeout vehicle? Yeah, we're good. All right, just checking.
Paul's fishing what I like to call a corner pocket. The end of a pool on either side in the corner. It's a great place for smallmouth to pinch off prey. I mean it's the, the terminus of a pool so it's a place where a lot of food stacks up. This access was actually one of the easier ones. I've hiked down creek beds to get to the river. A really wonderful tool for using creative access points is the drag strap. A small carabiner at one end of a rope and a section of PVC pipe at the other and you no longer need to stoop down to drag your kayak. across train tracks and scaled steep rocky banks. Chris has a slightly different version here. He made this one out of a, a dog leash. Either of them work equally as well. The longer the strap, the easier it is to pull it. Paul, you want this? Yeah. Another successful exploration trip. make some observations to kick off starting a pattern for the day but for right now let's say thank you to him get him back in see ya all right that 18 incher was right here the first part of pattern development is going to the spot where you caught the fish and making observations I just stuck my paddle down and I, I figured that it was I don't know what is that three and a half feet deep so a depth observation is good also the current you have really fast current here and pretty fast current here but he was in the area of less current there's still decent current right there uh, i'm judging the current by the speed of of the foam bubbles how fast the foam bubbles are moving so he was also up towards the top of the eddy that's another observation. So depth, current, and you know, the speed of the current and what the bottom substrate is. Those are three. Another observation 
that you have to make is, is more behavioral in nature. What did he hit? What was the what was the lure? How fast were you moving the lure? What I caught him on was his secret weapon lures, pro assassinator, double gold blade. Um, I got a trailer on there, real big profile, real nice big profile, and I was burning it. I was really moving it fast. So that's another part of it. Um, we'll catch some more, make some other observations, and see what common denominators pop up. Let's get a real good shot of the top of that, that eddy up there. That's the location. You go get another. All right, same spinner bait. I think it was up at the top of the the ledges up at the top of an eddy. We're going to run up there and find out. So I just measured him 19 half incher. We're going to see what commonalities this one had with the 18 incher I caught earlier. But let's let him go first. All right, I've come back up to the scene of the crime, the spot where that 19 and a half incher hit, uh, and he was right down here. I'm, I'm up shallow on top of this ledge rock, and I poked my paddle down there. It was the same rocky, hard, crunchy bottom that we had where the 18 incher was. Um, but something that is different is that it's not all the way at the top of a pool. There are some other points that that fish can move up into upstream of us. So it wasn't the very tip top of the pool. It was, however, pressed right up in the tip top of, um, of this little eddy here. Now the observations are, are just that. The commonality is it's at the top of, of the eddy. Um, similar depth, but it, it gets deeper as it goes back. So not completely a, a common trait. The lure, I was doing the same thing. It was the same spinner bait, that, that gold one right up there. Um, and I was moving it at the same speed. Speed of retrieval is a big part of pattern development. And we're catching some nice fish on these spinner baits. And one thing that I like to do when you have something that's working, change it up just a little bit. Um, I got Roy here who's filming. He's throwing a white one. I've been alternating between the gold one and the black one. And if one of them clearly outperforms the other, um, you know, then you're, you're starting to fine tune a pattern. You've already developed a pattern with the common traits of spinner bait moving fast at the top of an eddy over a harder bottom. Um, Let's refine that a little bit more. And that's, that's what we're working on now with three different colors of the same bait. The real power of pattern development and, and having a good pattern for the day is actually eliminating water. Uh, the, the common traits of the two nice catches that I've had so far today, the 18 and the 19 and a half, were that they are up at the top of an eddy, so an, an area of, of calm water, and they are right up towards the top. Um, they were somewhere in the middle of the water column. That's something I didn't touch on earlier. Sometimes you have to make that observation of, was it something that was a top water presentation somewhere in the middle, or was it on bottom? But these are middle of the water column presentations. And, um, you know, they're, they're pressed all the way up at the tops of the eddies. There's nothing out here in front of me. Go ahead and pan down here and, and you'll see what I mean. There's nothing down here in front of us in our immediate vicinity that fits that description. So what I'm doing with that is I'm pushing through this really quick because I've eliminated water so I can get to those high percentage spots that fit our set of common denominators. Even though the first two fish were caught in eddies caused by rocks, I won't hesitate to try areas of calm water caused by other things, such as this grass bed right here.
Uh, we haven't got any more bites on the other color spinner baits, so I'm changing up the what I have up front, what I have in rotation here. I'm sticking with a larger gold profile, just like that spinner bait that I got the two earlier on, uh, except I'm going with a jerk bait now instead. Just give them something a little bit different, but a lot of what's going on here is the same. It's still large and gold, and I'm gonna burn it. Switch to a rattle trap. Again, something gold and fast. Ah, he jumped once real good. I'm hoping he stays button. I got one hook in him. dimension to the the pattern today. I tried the suspending jerk bait and burning that real fast. That didn't work. And here I got something else just like that big spinner bait. I'll show you here in a second. But a big gold rattle trap just burned real fast, straining a lot of water. Golden fast, although we're gonna go back to that spot. See where this 18 and a quarter incher was was holding. There he goes. See ya. Ha <laughs> Yes! Let's go back and check out where he was at. This is what I got him on. A gold Rapala rattling wrap. And this is the spot where he was. It's the, the same overall presentation of you know big gold and fast um, he was up in a spot I, I stuck the paddle down and it was hard bottom about that deep same as the first one this morning uh, it wasn't at the top of the eddy it was out in the middle of some um, you know a series of ledges that are running this way that come up to the surface and come back down he was you know, he was tucked in behind one of the, the ledges there. Hey, got one. Another one on the rattle trap. It's just a middle of the water column crankbait as far as I'm concerned. Another nice one. Ah, get away from the legs. Another 18 or so. I don't like not being near my net. Okay, he's coming over here. Yeah, definitely part of the pattern today is middle of the water column. Always make sure you wet your hands before you touch these fish. Keep their slime on them. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't tried a crankbait that's that's digging at the bottom, but um, and I might do that just, just for kicks here later, but that's really what I consider that Rapala rattle and wrap is a middle of the, the water column crankbait. So let's get him back in there. This is my most important piece of fishing equipment. I write in it after every trip. I document successful patterns, linking them to the specific set of water and weather conditions for the day. I spend a lot of time uh, preparing for trips in terms of getting my gear ready, uh, retying lines, do, doing all kinds of stuff, pre-rigging baits, uh, but none of that is as important as preparing myself mentally with a positive mental attitude, uh, the attitude that I'm going to go out today and catch a lot of big fish. Uh, the best way to do that for me is reviewing this river fishing log. I keep detailed notes about uh, what I caught, the patterns that I, that I used to catch them, the conditions, 
and I like to go back to a, a situation where I have, you know, around the same time of year, um, similar conditions and review the successful patterns because I'd like to replicate that success. Uh, that sends me out onto the water with the positive metal attitude. It, it helps me catch big fish. Confidence is huge and having the right attitude uh, gets you to that confidence. Alright, we're here at a informal access. I uh, thought I'd consult with my river fishing log from about a year ago. Uh, we've had some thunderstorms, we've had a little bit of muddy water coming down one of the tributaries. Here's a day where I had about a foot of visibility on one side, about two and a half feet of visibility in the middle, and caught some nice fish here. 20 and a half, 18 and a quarter, and 18. There are a couple of them. I actually printed out the the gauge from that day and it's important to make record of the gauge so you have a an idea uh, when you can look back over the years what what specific levels mean uh, we're nowhere near that four and a half we've been down below three and we're heading back up over three now um, but we're gonna have some some turbidity in the water um, here are some lures that worked. That's what called a 20 and a half incher. A big black spinnerbait. I had been uh, leaving my big spinnerbait rod at home, but I put it in the the car today. It's it's packed in there. And um, reason being, I knew we would have some muddier water. Uh, another pattern with couple of 18 inches on crankbait. These are two lures, you know, a big bodied spinnerbait and a crankbait that I've not been using a lot recently in this low clear conditions. Uh, but we're going to give them a shot today because um, it may not be a finesse bite in this muddy water. The long book steered me to throw dark spinnerbaits. Oh, he's nice. I made an adjustment. Gold to black, which is showing up better. The black is showing up nicer. A band of muddy water coming out of a tributary, hard hit by overnight thunderstorms, was the perfect match to the pattern. What was happening is I was getting short hit. I was getting fish to hit it. but not meaningfully. So I went from like a greeny gold color to this dark black, black and red, and uh, pretty quickly picked up this nice one. The other adjustment I made to catch this, this nice 18 inch river smallmouth is that I switched the blade out, which is you can keep you know your head and skirt the same uh, with the Secret Weapons spinner bait, uh, but I switched the blade out. There's a clip right in there, and I went from a willow leaf to this number five gold Colorado. Made for some real nice thumping in this, in this slightly muddy water. I think that helped him find it a little bit better. So let's go ahead and get him back in the water. Hopefully catch him when he's 21. Speed up the lure choice part of pattern development, familiarize yourself with what they eat. Forge assessment must be done on a trip by trip basis. Seasonal changes in the coloration and prevalence of crayfish, aquatic insects, and other fish mean that what they're eating today may not be what they want next weekend. Hey Chris, I was reading a book about the, the guys that have caught the world record smallmouth down on Dale Hollow. There's a book that covers, you know, like the top five. One of the guys talked about 
the uh, the crayfish changing color throughout the the lunar phase, the moon phase. Do you believe in that? Actually, I do. I mean, I don't think it. it I don't think it's the case in all river systems or all lakes. But I know, like on the North Branch, it's definitely true because I'm there a lot, so I, I check up, the, check them out. Um, this blue color is quite common. But what I notice is is that in the um, earlier in the, the moon phase, when they almost get their new shell, they almost have a a blue that glows almost all the way through the entire back claw. And the closer it gets to the to the cycle again, the darker they get. I also notice that in the in the spring and winter, they're really dark and their bottoms are really, really light. Their bottoms are, are extremely light. There's also, I think, in this river system alone, there's six or seven different types of crayfish. So to rule out, you know, one color over another, I think is, is difficult. But you can take a look in here and see that, you know, obviously a roadkill or a camo is going to do a great job here. So what, what colors do you always make sure you have on hand? Uh, a green pumpkin is almost always there, and a watermelon red, I think, is a good one. Anything with purple fleck in it can also be good. And they look different in the water. Now, this water's kind of cloudy, so you're not going to be able to see it. But they look a lot more brilliant in the water. See that color? Yeah. Looks a lot more brilliant in the water. Looks more red. You can see the, the blues on his legs. Yep, really good. I can flip them over. So let me flip them over a little bit. You can really see it on the, on the bottom part. When, that, when it's springtime, that'll be all blue in there. That'll be all blue. Very cool. Take notice of what protrudes from their gullet. What have they coughed up during the fight? I know that this is lake footage, not river footage. And yes, reservoir kayak fishing skills will be another later DVD. But this shows what you can learn from vomit. Oh, what did he cough up? He just coughed up a little bluegill. Let's see what he barfed up. Yeah, that was a bluegill. I feel bad that he isn't benefiting from it anymore, but maybe something else will. Certainly the crayfish here will. But Looking down in a fish's gullet or seeing seeing what they cough up gives us good indication as to you know the types of lures that we should be throwing. But you know the bluegill obviously is a very prevalent uh, forage for these smallmouth out here. So keeping a trip logbook will help you retain lessons learned through pattern development and forage assessment. But if you prefer the quicker, easier route, look for my upcoming seasonal patterns DVDs on river smallmouth, reservoir bass, and tidal largemouth. I fish year-round, and I'd like to teach you what I've learned about catching them when it's about to ice over, when it seems like it's too hot for them to bite, and everything in between. These DVDs are being filmed with the expertise of local kayak fishing guides, fisheries biologists, and weekend warriors such as yourself. It's almost like it aggravates the fish. I'll buzz it through the faster water, let it sit in the pocket. I mean, you bring up two great points too. I mean, we were on, I had a guy trip not too long ago where I, I take a, a large zero spoon and I'll twist the, the hooks down so you don't catch anything. The seasonal patterns DVDs will be available for sale on kayakbassfishing.com or wherever you purchase this copy. Thank you very much for being my audience. I'd also like to thank my sponsors Wilderness Systems Kayaks, Adventure Technology Paddles. KayakBassFishing.com and Secret Weapon Lures. Graphic design work done by Fish Deviate.